Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Bill Hershey, and I'm thrilled to have a guest with me. We met in a, a course, actually, a business training course by Danny Innie. It was called Hybrid Course University. And gosh, you know, we started having these conversations, myself and Suzanne Finder. Uh, we both have some common ground in that we're fascinated by the human nervous system and how we respond to stress. And we're also very much implanted in business. We're, we're also very interested in using our business skills to help ourselves. And you know, for me, this is very much true. I love helping others make a great living doing what they love and delivering phenomenal services to their communities. So we're going to explore this fascinating topic. For me, it's fascinating. And Susan, Suzanne, of course, agrees. Um, how, what's going on in our nervous system when we're having conversations with people in the business context and really specifically in the context of a sales conversation? How many people here have struggled with being in a sales conversation? For me, this was probably the scariest moment in the history of me being an entrepreneur, being on that first sales call for my first prospective client. It's like, gosh, wow, I had no idea what I was going to face in that. I had no idea what I would have to unravel after that conversation. So it got me really curious, what is going on here? So we're going to explore that and hopefully give you some tools and strategies to make it maybe just a little bit easier for you as you approach these conversations. And gosh, wow. So Suzanne, you are, you know, you have this deep background, decades of experience working in uh, corporate sales, I believe. And you, you basically transitioned, you've transformed, you've become a nervous system educator. Maybe we can start just by asking, wow, that's so curious. What, what was your journey like leading you from one island to the next in that journey? Wow. Ooh. So things that I didn't realize were completely out of my control, actually. Right. So there was an exit point with corporate. And I moved, sold my house in Connecticut, moved to the West Coast, started a consulting business. And the first deal didn't go very far. And my partner and I negotiated a couple of deals. The, what we thought was going to be the first solid deal fell apart at the last minute. Uh, we had raised a million dollars for our client. And the client dropped the ball. The funder uh, pulled out. And it was devastating. I mean, it was absolutely devastating. Um, I didn't think I wanted to go back to corporate, but that really set me on a journey of mm, lots of personal discovery, facing my fears of really being a failure. Uh, now, this is despite having been President's Club top 10% in two Fortune 500s, right? Being featured in a magazine, having all of these external things, um, but it didn't do anything to address my PTSD and uh, underlying sense of unworthiness. I'm so, sorry, yeah, Suzanne, I just wanted the significance of this. This is like a big deal, the President's Club. What, what, for, for those who aren't familiar, what, what does that mean? That means that you're in the top 10% of all sellers, typically a few hundred sellers, maybe more in an organization. I mean, it's a pretty elite award, uh, lots of money associated with that. Um, Part of me thinks that I was in the right place at the right time, but also I just kept showing up. I kept doing what I was supposed to do. Um, yeah, it was it was a heady time. It was a time of lots of money, lots of accolades. And yet I really struggled with a lot of personal issues through it all. Um, and what really, you know, I'm kind of fast forwarding, what really got me intrigued is that it was my nervous system that kept getting stuck over and over, that kept me in this um, trance of unworthiness spiral, if you will. So I know Can we you may say that again. <laughs> that sounds like a really interesting word. Yeah, the trance of unworthiness. Uh... And whatever trance we're in, we bring that into a sales conversation. 
because we are mammals, we want to be part of something. We want others to like us. Um, it, is, it is a matter of survival at the very most core of us, right? So when we get into conversations that might have, um, might be anxiety provoking, something new, you know, we have our self doubts. Ooh, what do we do now? This is really all about the nervous system running the show and not uh, really have anything to do with our worth whatsoever. So it's a very deep journey if we want to explore there. Um, I know we, we sort of talked before our, the start of the webinar about this, you know, how deep do we want to go? But um, when we're in front of others, we make meanings of what that means about ourselves with our own performance. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Thank you, Suzanne. You know, the, as we're talking about this, I'm realizing there's there's a couple different things going on here. There's this deeply internal process relating to our past story, right? Our past experience. And the meaning that we make of that as we approach these situations and engage and come out of these situations. And then there's this other component of really a shared story, this, this dynamic of with this other human being and, and navigating that on top of our internal dynamic. Yes. So this is, this is complex. If we start to pick apart the anatomy of what's going on here, right? Perhaps yeah. a more appropriate place to start because it seems like the internal dynamic dynamic is really the foundation here, doesn't it? Oh, no question. No question. Because when we feel, oh, I'm okay. I'm here. I'm okay. We can then focus on the other and focus on what they're saying. Not just what they're saying, but how they're saying it. Because we're mammals, we have this innate ability to read the other. But when we get caught in our own stuff, we kind of tunnel vision and we can't read what they're saying clearly. Their body posture, what's happening around their eyes, what's happening around their face. We sort of shut down and turn inward. Where in a sales conversation, if we can be really fully present to what's going on, that person gets an understanding, not consciously, all this is happening at a not conscious level. And we'll talk about what, what I mean by that in just a second. But they can pick up, oh, this person's really here, really here with me. That's what we all want, right? This person's really listening and asking really good questions, not from the perspective of how can she prove something to me, but really a genuine interest and curiosity in what's going on. And that requires us as providers of whatever service it is to really be safe. And I use that word, um, it's a funny little word, but really trust ourselves that no matter what happens, Whatever occurs, whatever the outcome is, we're going to be okay. So many sellers and many trainings are all about focusing on the outcome, visualizing the outcome. Um, there's nothing wrong with visualizing good outcomes. What happens, though, when that outcome doesn't occur the way we would like, right? We think we've done maybe something wrong. Maybe our job gets threatened. Maybe our revenue isn't what we need it to be. And there are dire consequences, right? So when we can move back to the sense of I'm okay no matter what happens, we can be present for the other. And therefore, we can ask those good heartfelt questions and people always want to do business with, if they have the financial resources, if they're really looking for that project or process or um, support, 
they'll say yes, because we want to work with people who we believe are really with us, uh, really understand us, who we can be safe with. Wow, this is, this is so rich here. And so you're with somebody in a conversation, you're going into a conversation with somebody, of course, we're in business, and we, we would be delighted to have the sale. And this it gets a little even psycho-spiritual here. Yeah. Are we to not be attached to the outcome? And if so, how do we desire an outcome without being attached to the outcome? How do you aim for the target yet be okay if we totally miss the target or if we don't even fire the arrow at all? Ooh, great question. What would it mean if we missed the target? See, that's at the crux of your question. If we make the meaning, which by the way, comes from, well, this might be a good, come, but let's come back to that question. Let's come back to that question and look at the difference between conscious mind, which is a question that you're asking about, and non-conscious mind. So the conscious mind, what we think of as thinking is volitional. Volitional meaning like we choose. We choose, exactly. We choose. And that aspect, that level of the mind operates at about 128 bits of information in a second. Now I can count to 128. Okay, right. I get it. But the non-conscious mind, what happens in the nervous system is operating at 12 million bits of information a second. You put did you, 120. Did you say that again? 120 and what was the other one? 12 million. Now that statistic comes from Tornoriander and um, not something that I that I made up. But um would have been fun if I if I had done the actual research on that. Nevertheless, our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system drives our behavior both defensive behavior as well as collaborative behavior. When our nervous system is regulated, meaning we can move easily from one state, defense or activation to ease and relaxation, you can see I'm moving my body. We can then flow when that uh, yucky feeling comes up in the pit of our stomach, like I'm in trouble, right? We can practice Mm, I'm going to use this word, it may seem funky in a business conversation, but we can practice self-soothing, that awareness that mm, something in my nervous system just set off an alarm. That comes from a very old pattern within us that was likely formed before the age of seven. Mm -hmm. And I, if I can pause here, there's something really subtle, but foundationally important here that I, I believe you're pointing out here, Susan, the act, and I'm going to call it an act, the act of noticing when that alarm goes off. Would you agree that this is where the journey starts? Oh, Bill, yes, absolutely. What's also interesting about what you just said is when we're in defense mode, that fight or flight, we're not even aware. The body will start numbing those sensations as a defense mechanism. Now, when we numb, we're also numbing our access. And when I say we, we're not doing this intentionally. This is completely out of our awareness. This is non-conscious autonomic processing happening with adrenaline and cortisol, norepinephrine and all these other chemicals saying, oop, we could be in trouble here. We're gonna prepare for fight or flight, right? And we start scrambling because we don't know what else to do. Well, interestingly, those chemicals, those uh, neurochemicals also shut down our access to prefrontal cortex, what we think of as thinking. And we operate kind of on autopilot. We can't be, if we're not present in our bodies, 
If we don't notice, oh, this is what's going on, we can't get back to self-regulation. Or, oh, okay, I can take a deep breath. I'm really okay right now. There was a meaning I made about what just happened. And I'm feeling the feeling. Let's, let's let it go. Now, in a sales conversation, I may not be putting my hand on my, my chest or my, my sternum. Uh, breath work definitely helps the last for sure. And we can do things in a conversation, especially if it's on the phone or Zoom, that, you know, so that you know that you are taking care of yourself and the prospective client doesn't see us doing some funky, you know, movement or something like that. But we'll get into that in a minute. You know, I, and I just want to share with you this insight that I had since I started my um, somatic training. I started noticing things. Of course, that's the name of the game, noticing things, right? But something that really stood out to me was I was watching this um, Pearl Jam interview from like the early 90s on YouTube one day. And I thought it was so interesting that these guys in the band like, you know, they're in their young 20s probably at the time, long hair, surfers, big dudes. And I saw them doing it. So they're on, like on this interview on national cable TV. Like, I'm sure they're kind of like a little bit in this space of like, what? Well, I mean, they're probably used to it. They're doing it. They're on stage for thousands of people every night, right? Yeah, you know, they're probably, their ner nervous system is probably active, maybe activated in some ways. They're doing something so interesting. I can't do it here because I'm standing, but they were they were kind of like moving. They, they were kind of like moving in their chairs. It was almost like they were dancing, but not like overtly, but they weren't stiff. They weren't like, you know, and they were like rubbing their legs. I was like, wow, that is just so smart. So here's my secret. I actually, below my desk, will rub my hands. I'll be rubbing my legs sometimes. I'll be like feeling my feet into the ground. What do you think is going on when we're doing these self-soothing movements? And maybe we can even name some other like little tricks and techniques that we can do that aren't so noticeable to our prospective client. Yeah. Great. In this state of self-regulation. So when we move, we're dispelling or dispersing the cortisol. We're, we're, we're shaking it out in a way that, um, you know, if we're sitting in front of a prospect, Maybe we can't do, um, but that movement, you know, we're trained, Bill, to sit still, right? What does school teach us to do? What do our parents tell us to do? Be quiet. So we, will, we have these conflicting trainings going on, right? Our older training is sit still, stay calm. Don't let anyone see what we're doing. Don't let, don't let that sweat show, right? And yet nervous systems are constantly communicating with each other. So those subtle cues of what's happening in my nervous system are actually being reflected around my eyes. We have all these little muscles that are connected. Everyone's talking about the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the primary conduit for information from the viscera up to the brain. And the vagus nerve touches just about every major organ in the body and it regulates all the organ systems. So what we're actually doing when we do, when we're breathing, when we're moving, um, we're telling the vagus to exert more influence on reducing the adrenaline and cortisol. They call it, when I say they, Steve Porges uh, and, and the researchers out there in this process call it the vagal brake. It's kind of like the brake on our car. So we're speeding up and we put the brake on. So these movements, breath work, rubbing our thighs, being aware of what's happening in the body allows us to go, oh, I'm actually really safe right now. And this is, oh, this is something I can handle. I've been here before. 
and the nervous system stops sending out so much adrenaline and cortisol. So it's really a matter of balance. Remember those old scales? You know, I think of like a movie from the 19 or 1800s, you know, the costume, the period things, and they go into a shop and they're measuring things on this scale. They're putting little ingots or whatever they're called on the scale. We just want to have more safety than threat going on in that moment. It's not about fully being anything. It's about putting on enough vagal break, right? Recognizing enough, oh, I'm okay in this moment. That brings us back to having access to what we think of as thinking. This is really interesting. So it's really not about avoiding the stress, but having enough of an anchor to be able to like ride the waves. Yes. Is that right? Yes. yes. So if we didn't have a wave, I live in Southern California, about five minutes from the beach. If we didn't have a wave, we couldn't surf. We couldn't, we couldn't experience the exhilaration, right? We don't want to shut down activation. Activation brings spice to life. Um, and we also want to remember that the idea is that we're flowing between the two systems the relaxation system and the excitement system, we can have them both at the same time. Like right now, I have both at the same time, right? Um, I'm activated. I don't often, at least not yet, give a lot of interviews live. Um, and so I'm aware, oh yeah, this is going on for me, right? I can feel that my skin temperature is a little warmer than, than let's say I was having coffee with a friend at a coffee shop. Right um, now, in my sales conversation, I'm very comfortable. I, I I did not care for the corporate experience nearly as much. The corporate experience was sort of um, hunter and or huntress, you know, and um, can be very threatening. In my situation now, when I speak with a leader or I speak to an individual. Um, I can be very safe in asking questions because I I'm just very confident in what I do and and um, if someone is really available to do the work they will and I also know that whoever shows up and says yes great and whoever shows up and there isn't a fit I say thank you if there's not a fit it doesn't benefit either them or me. So again, where do we put our attention on the outcome? Do we think, oh, I have to, um, this is the huntress, do I have to knock down uh, five out of 10 or 10 out of 10 or seven out of 10, whatever the numbers are? Um, or do I want to be working with the people that, I, that resonate with me and I resonate with them so that we really get to do this collaborative work together. And that's where the juice of life is. That's where the juice is for me anyway. Um, you know, Bill, that I'm a Course in Miracles student. And the course talks about joining with another is where the healing is. And that can happen in sales. That can happen in any vocation if we choose to let that be what we focus on, and that takes practice. Just keeps it. It takes practice. People want a magic bullet. Well, if I do this one thing once or twice, am I going to be okay? I got to tell you, the answer is no. <laughs> we are working many times with very old, ingrained nervous system patterns, and it just takes time. It takes practice. I think about wax on and wax off right? Wax on, wax off. He had to practice that over and over so that when we, he was in a stressful situation, those nervous system fibers fired, right? So being patient, trusting ourselves, coming again, coming back to the, I'm okay many times a day, recognizing the okayness. We go through life just kind of barreling through without 
taking a pause. Ah, uh, I'm okay. The more we can do that during the day, and this is kind of segueing me into a great uh, exercise that we can do mm -hmm. throughout the day. We don't want to rely on just doing these exercises when we're in the conversation. That's almost too late. So one of the things I love is this idea of a yawn stretch. Mm -hmm. Now a yawn stretch, I don't know if you have a, a little fur baby. I have a little cat and she may be curled up in a ball, but every 60 to 90 minutes she gets up, she stretches, and then she goes back into her little curled up ball, right? So a yawn stretch is where we can really extend and feel our bodies and move around and really stretch, really get into those places that are tight and see what spontaneous breathing comes up. And if we could practice that every 60 to 90 minutes throughout the day, it's kind of like recharging a battery. Oh yeah, I'm safe. Oh yeah, I'm okay. That spontaneous breath. Feels so much better. <laughs> After just that one, that was less than a minute. That was like, what, 20 seconds. One last comment, I think we're gonna take questions unless you have more questions for me is, we hold our breath when we are under stress. So practicing that big yawn stretch, letting that air in helps to increase the vagal break, helps to increase, they also call it vagal tone, V-A-G-A-L tone. No, whoever is listening, you can, um, uh, Google some of this and look up Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S, Dr. Porges' work. Tons of YouTubes, tons of um, papers, uh, lots of scientific uh, published articles. Yes, he is absolutely awesome. I have a, so if there was a, um, a Mick Jagger of this world, he is it for me. I have a serious grandpa crush on him. Amazing. You know, Suzanne, there's, there's a lot of avenues we can explore. And I'm almost wondering, gosh, because it, 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 I'm a preparer. I came in with like 12 really juicy questions and we are just scraping the tip of the iceberg. So how many, you know, throw it in chat. If you would like to see a part two of this interview series, I'm calling it a series already. Let us know because gosh, you know, really just we're just scraping the surface right now. Okay, we got some yes pleases going on here. Um, Suzanne, I, I have a question and then yeah, let's let's take it from the group. What I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invite you to put a question in the QA section of Zoom. And if you'd like, I'm happy to invite you on as a panelist to ask your question to Suzanne. If you prefer not, just decline the invite and I'll ask it on your behalf. So I'll, I'll give you a minute to go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. Gosh, there's a couple paradigms that we learn just in marketing and sales. And I'd like to kind of look at a couple of these now that we're talking about a very different approach to sales. One of them is, you, you kind of talked about it before, it's a numbers game. You just have to talk to enough people. It's a numbers game. So What's our updated, what is our more enlightened approach to this, you know, responding to this thought, okay, is it really a numbers game? Is that true? Is that so? And the second piece here, if, if I can just throw these both on the map, because they may be interrelated. Instead of going into a conversation with the, the very conventional view, view of how am I going to make this a sale? Or are you going to buy my services? What if we were going into that conversation instead saying, are we a fit? What changes when that intentionality, that question shifts within us? So a lot, just, lot there. I think you just Good. answered the question in, in, in the question. <laughs> so, so which feels more pressured? You know, I have to make this sale. Or, hmm, are we a good fit? Yeah. 
pressure. And so the, this pressure, this is like, this is like the subject when we're talking about sales, right? This is like the elephant in the room that are either party talking about that pressure, right? No, we're not, it's almost like we're not allowed to talk about that in that kind of pressured conversation. So you want to explore that? Sure. I think it's up to us as the provider to take off the pressure. And that requires that inner work, right? And on the other hand, it is a numbers game. So one of the marketers that I really admire as a marketer, his name is Frank Kern. I worked in two of his businesses. Um, he talked about this idea of preconditioning. So we use our marketing to precondition, meaning prepare our prospects for a conversation. And we take the pressure off of ourselves. So we don't have to have the pressure in the sales conversation. The more we can get folks to raise their hand and self-select and say, wow, I really need what I think I hear you offering and make it more of a question, is it for me? And is, is what you do for me? And are you the provider uh, for me? Um, and then on our side as the provider, trusting that everything's okay, even when a person isn't a fit. See, part of the problem is, Bill, we, um, we have a very hard time because of our nervous system of being really honest with ourselves. We don't wanna see the fear or the anxiety. We keep pushing it down and pushing it down and pushing it down and trying to hide it, but it reinforces that feedback loop. So in working with an SE, a somatic experiencing provider or someone like myself, a nervous system educator who uses a lot of somatic processes, um, and Dr. Porges intervention as well. Um, we can then look at what's creating pressure in ourselves. Once we can address that and be present to it and see it for what it is, and that takes a while, right? We can then bring ourselves into more of a relaxation when we are with someone reminding ourselves, this is not a life-threatening situation. This is um, a story maybe that I was telling myself about my worthiness. If this person says no to me, I must, there must be something wrong. That is what we have to get to, to be really great sellers, be really great providers. We've got to clean our own stuff up in order for other people to feel safe, right? The, the idea, there's a, a term called co-regulating. We're always co-regulating. The person that has the stronger mm, grounding in whatever it is they're in. So if I am very, very anxious, right? Very, very anxious. Um, I'm still co-regulating with the other, right? The more grounded I can be in that calm state, the better I will be at sharing that calm state and relaxing the other person to see they don't have to be in defense. I love it. We have a question here. And uh, it's actually from uh, one of our participants, Celeste. She's going to come on here and ask. Uh, I think this is Celeste. Um, <laughs> so nice Wasn't to it? see you. Thank um, you. Thank you. Hi, Celeste. Hi there. <laughs> nice to see you, Suzanne. Um, so my question was, I can remember exactly what I said. Um, would it be helpful in a sales call prior to starting actually really having much of a conversation? Since the people I work with are childhood trauma survivors, and I get that too, which is I was going, oh, well, I need to be doing these exercises for me. And I do do a little bit, but I realize maybe I need to do more um, prior to having a conversation with somebody from that perspective. 
would it be helpful to ask them to breathe with me or to move with me before we start talking? Because I'm that's what I'm going to be looking to do with them in the course anyway. Yes. Really? Yeah. I love that question. And here's why. When when I feel like the person is really going on and on in their in their re-traumatization. I always say, hey, would it be okay if we can stop and just breathe together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we take a breath. Yes. And it allows them to relax a little bit, just to create a little opening. Right. And then they may get caught up again and say again, yeah, I'm I'm realizing that I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling uh tense right now when we breathe together. In certain vocations, yeah, let's let's do that. In others, you know, we may not be able to, but you're Celeste in a great position to practice, bring someone in to that practice even before they engage uh, with a financial commitment. I, as, as you were talking, I was like, oh, wait a minute. What if I did that? What would happen for them? What would happen to the, and I think, I mean, you said something too earlier about, about co-regulating, right? It's like, so if we're both in that place and if I'm in a calm place to begin with and we start breathing together or, or doing even that stretch, ah, Thing together, they're going to be, um, they're going to be co- co-regulating even more closely with me. Which it's not just me getting calmer; it's them also getting calmer within that. So that, and it also gives them a taste for what we're going to be doing. So that's not a bad thing, right? I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's great. Very <laughs> effective. Very effective. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I love that, and you know it. In the marketing world, there's this concept of the pink spoon. And, you know, for for me and Suzanne, we're, we're in this group with Danny Any. Uh, it's a company called Miracy. He talks about it a lot. The pink spoon. Have you heard of the pink spoon strategy? So I haven't. Is, have, if you've gone to a Baskin Robbins, this is where it comes from. You can you get this little spoon and you can have a taster of the different mm-hmm. ice creams and you can figure out which one you want. How nice. So. How do we, as service providers, give people a pink spoon, a free sample of what it's like, a taste of what it's like to work with us? Perhaps mm-hmm. you know, this is. This sounds like a wonderful pink spoon that we can offer here in the sales conversation, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I like that. I mean, thank you for that term, pink, pink spoon. I had not heard that before. <laughs> yes, it's memorable, right? Yeah, it is. Um, Beth and Robbins used to be a favorite of mine, so I. <laughs> Thank you. We even got this now nostalgia effect going there. I know, right? Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Which is, well, you know, okay, that's very interesting. Like, is it manipulative to bring nostalgia for the purpose of deepening connection and potentially closing a sale? Great. Is question. it manipulative? Hmm. So, what? So, Manipulative is a very interesting word. Yeah. Right. When we come back to ventral or safety within the nervous system, we're manipulating our nervous system. Manipulate in its purest sense means just to move. So for me in my practice, helping people move into safety, manipulate their nervous system. To, for greater health and regulation, we are manipulating mm-hmm. just like a massage therapist manually uses his or her hands to manipulate the muscles. We're doing something very similar. It's all um, a matter, I think, of, of creating genuine trust. If the, And I don't know that there's such a thing as false trust, but if there were, Right. And I can think of situations that have created a lot of false trust. Okay. It's not really integrous. People use it. But for me, yeah, we want to create more trust and safety in the sales conversation for that person to be, to raise their hand and say, yeah, I'd like to work with you. 
I think this would be helpful for me. And it's a natural movement into that, you know, that, well, what's next? What do you feel uh, is the best next step for you? Right. Yeah. Would you like for us to work together? Right. Very natural. Very like, okay. It's like, are we going to, are we, are we, you know, we're talking about dating. Do we want to go out? You know, it's okay if they say no. That, it's okay if they say no. What? That's, so, wow, we can say that. How do we live that? It's okay if they say no. Great question. And this is, this, this gets into the, let's have a series because we need to go within and look at all of the meanings that we made as little ones about the, I'm not worthy. I'm not important. I'm not good enough. I don't matter. That's where this comes from. It lives in the nervous system. And remember, I don't know if I shared this, the nervous system is a surveillance, 24 seven surveillance system. Are we safe? Are we under threat? So if there's stuff running of early childhood um, disconnections, those disconnections will keep coming up until they're repaired. Steve Porges calls trauma this a sense or a, a state of chronic disconnection. It's not the what happened, it's what's remaining in the tissues. The issues are in the tissues. Uh, uh, the that, issues are in that, the tissues. Yes, that um, we need to address. And, and this is a very deeply spiritual waking up process because, and it's it's very difficult because. Let's say I'm 61 and um, I recognize that a particular idea that I had about myself, not just at an intellectual level, but a deep visceral level, has been running everything, uh, my relationships, my choices, my behaviors for, let's just call it 50 years. That can be very very frightening to really recognize and go, oh, I've wasted my life or whatever, right? So we do this gently and slowly, just like we work with our clients, but it does take work in order to be self-regulated. We have to look at where the dysregulation comes from. Now, a number of practitioners would, would maybe not agree with that, and that's okay. Uh, I happen to be an interfaith minister, and um, this is my this is my practice, right? This is where I come from. That um, everything that shows up, we can use to wake up. It's totally up to us if we want to do that or not. It's not about me uh, forcing my clients to do anything. We work in steps and stages. We first work with the physiology. So there's a middle ear muscle called the stapedius. It's the smallest muscle in the human body. I thought this was fascinating. And it flattens in response to chronic stress and unresolved trauma. And Could you show us the shape of that and how it flattens? Uh, that visual that you did in our previous conversation was yeah. beautiful. So think of a little um, pumpkin seed. It's kind of that shape trying to get the visual here on the Zoom. Mm. And when we've had early childhood trauma, it could be medical trauma, it could be anything, the muscle will flatten, essentially turning off. Now this muscle is only a millimeter long. It hangs out in the middle ear. And what it does is it filters frequencies. So when the shape is rounded, when, it, you know, it's kind of like a bicep, you know, you can have a flat bicep or you can have a nice, sexy rounded bicep. When it flattens, what happens is it allows in more threatening high, high uh, frequency and low, low frequency tones inaudible. It just keeps the nervous system more attuned for threat. 
for threat. So what we do when I work with clients initially is we work on reshaping that muscle. What's and that, the is that a, again? The muscle is the stapedius. Stapedius. Okay. Stapedius. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, Suzanne, this is so rich. I, I think everybody's like, kind of like, we're in the choir saying, yeah, we need more of this. Let's schedule another call and continue this. I think what we've mapped out here is, is kind of the energetic foundation, really, of this whole subject that the name of the game starts with how do we create safety in the sales conversation? And that leads us back to the primary part of how do we create safety within our own nervous system? You got it. Safety within our own nervous system. You got it. So to be continued, huh? This is so wonderful. I am just overjoyed. How many people, like, how many people love what Suzanne is talking about here? Just let me, you could throw it in chat. Um, just say love in chat if this is like, yes, yes. Yeah. And that's what my nervous system is saying. Like, yes, more, please. Oh my gosh. Right. Okay. We got some hearts going up on the screen. So I want to honor our time. Thank you all. I know many of you here are busy folks. Maybe you got even appointments with clients coming up. So I want to, I want to respect that. Uh, I'll be in touch. We're going to have a recording go out to everybody who's on the email list. If you're not on the email list, reach out um, and I'll make sure that you get a, re a recording. And Suzanne, before we part, I know you have some information that I think that could be valuable for these folks. Do you, do you have something that you can offer to these folks that they can kind of take this a little deeper? Yes, Bill. And in fact, I need to get you a link. I just developed a quiz to really see where is your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be very insightful. And then if it makes sense, we can have a conversation. Um, there's also a lot of information. Uh, if you were to go to the polyvagalinstitute.org and it covers a lot of Dr. Stephen Porges work. Uh, there's a wonderful Harvard Business Review article that we're gonna post on how do you manage under a really stressful situation? How do you self-regulate? Now, the article is just a little, little surfacey taste of um, what, what really is needed to practice. Uh, none of this is intellectual, right? We can't address a feelings problem, right? Stress with intellectualizing, reading a book, um, all of that, you know, memorizing, none of that's going to work. Because remember, it's 128 versus 12 million. We've got to get the 12 million on board so that that's what's driving the bus, right? That's what's driving the bus. Love it. Love it. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Yeah, thank you for being here. Looking forward to our next episode. Thank you, everybody. Uh, if, if you would love to share how this is landing for you, maybe it takes some time for this to kind of like coalesce and set in and kind of recalibrate a little bit. I would love to hear what's going on and what you're seeing differently and doing differently as a result. So um, let's keep the conversation rolling. Looking forward to next time. Thanks again, Suzanne. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Bye for now. <laughs>